verse number one. I should ask you, what book are we preaching out of this year? How many of y'all enjoying it? Amen. I saw so many of you, y'all killed that February book of Acts challenge. Clap for yourself. Y'all did amazing. Somebody said, well, Bishop, I ain't, you know, I ain't really finished mine. Will you start it? God bless you. God bless you. Acts chapter number three, verse number one. Can we stand for the reading of the word? <clears throat> the Bible says, now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer. The ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he leaping up stood and walked and entered the temple with them walking leaping and praising God and all the people saw him walking and praising God then they knew it was he who who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him verse one now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour your neighbor say neighbor today we're going to talk about prayer partners you may be seated in the presence of the Lord let's talk about prayer partners me and this jacket are not going to make it so if you can help me real quick Somebody say, Bishop, why don't you wear more suits? Because I don't enjoy preaching in them. I love a good suit, but they, they wear well, but they just preach miserably. Here I go to preach. <laughs> so thank y'all for letting me, you know, just kind of be me. The book of Acts has been absolutely fascinating to me. When God began to talk to me about uh, digging into the book of Acts and teaching through the book of Acts, I understood that one of the things the Lord wanted us to do was to revisit and rediscover the original foundations of faith that were laid out for the church. Uh, in order sometimes for you to understand your future, you have to revisit your foundations. Uh, one of the things that I find so unique and so uh, attractive to me in the book of Acts is how Jesus goes about through the person of the Holy Spirit constructing for himself a people that operate in the earth like he did when he was physically present. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated because he takes what we know because we have the backdrop of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we can look back at Matthew the tax collector and realize he didn't really deserve to be a Gospel writer. We can, we can look back at Peter and we can find every reason to pick Peter's testimony and purpose apart because we have the backdrop of his history. But what's amazing is God takes this small group of misfits and out of them creates this whole, this whole conglomerate, this whole ecclesia, this assembly of called out ones. And he gives them an assignment. He gives them a purpose. He gives them what we call the great commission. Everybody say the great commission. 
the Great Commission because when Jesus is getting ready to ascend to the right hand of the Father where he now sits every day, ever living to make intercession for us. In other words, Jesus lives to pray for you. That if you ever go through a season where you can find nobody in the earth to pray with you, there was someone sitting at close proximity at the right hand of the Father ever living to intercede for you. Understanding that sometimes even your best friend doesn't know how to pray for you. Sometimes the truth is there are people that love you that don't know how to pray. But Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father and sits there praying and ensuring that you will never get you will never uh, be in a situation that he does not bring you out of can you just tell the truth uh every now and then we church folk like to say i've been praying for you what we really mean is i've been thinking about you to, to pray means you actually said something to god about me i'm glad you were thinking about me but in this season i need somebody who's going to pray for me and then and, and, and call my name I, I got too much going on don't, don't just let me be a thought you think about Wendy's I need you to pray for me <laughs> I need you to pray for me and, and and so you make it through stuff and how do you make it through if you really don't have folk who are really praying because I always have at least one person in the universe praying for me I feel like screaming right there I always have at least one person in the universe here's a powerful thing uh, to niche, minister to niche about him praying is Jesus has never prayed a prayer that the father did not answer and so as long as the son of the living God is praying for me I'll make it out all right oh God and, and, and so as Jesus is going to the right hand of the Father, he says, listen, guys, here's what I want you to know. I'm going to give you power after the Holy Ghost comes on you, and you're to be my witnesses to the world. In other words, he says, I started a mission, and I need you to help me carry out this mission. In other words, to every person, hear me carefully, under the sound of my voice, if you are breathing, you have a purpose. You may not know exactly what it is. You may not know the details of how it's going to be executed. But if you are breathing, sitting in this sanctuary or watching me online, God saved you for a purpose. And even if you are not saved yet, never gave your life to Jesus, he created you according to his purpose. And so even if you hadn't found out who he is and who you are and why you're here, God has a reason for your existence so he says I'm gonna give them this so the whole reason of their coming together is the great commission and the great commandment hear me carefully that the church exists for a purpose everybody say we're here for a purpose and, and we can't forget that like like we're here to love the Lord our God with all our heart soul mind and strength and our neighbors as ourselves and we are also here, everybody say, to fulfill the Great Commission. Everybody say, what's the Great Commission? You do know it's twofold. Everybody say, Great Commission is twofold. Here's what we normally say, go into all the world, preach the gospel. Right? He that believes, this is Mark 16, and is baptized shall be what? Saved. He that believe not shall be condemned. Right? Everybody say, go preach. Get people saved. That's one part of the Great Commission. Can I show you the second part of the Great Commission? Sometimes we do the first part okay. Depends on what season we're in. But we rarely do the second part that well. Because it's Matthew 28. He says, go ye therefore and make disciples. Oh God. Everybody say, first he says, get them saved. But then he says, I need you to make them disciples. What happens is, if I make a decision that gets me delivered, but I never am discipled, I will end up disappointed. See, getting saved means I got out. But getting discipled means I became something else. Yeah. Glory to God. 
Now, now, I can in one experience with you share the gospel and you make a decision that causes you to receive salvation. But discipleship requires discipline. God help me. Discipleship means I have to get involved in your life. We have to do life together. We have to spend time together. That's why not everybody who ate the fish and loaves was a disciple. See, there are, there's a difference between the crowd and the disciples. The crowd are the people he feeds. The disciples are the people he leads. Now, here's the other thing. Nobody can make you a disciple outside of your decision. The difference between the two is the level of commitment between them. And so he says, I want you to begin to make disciples of them. And so what happens is, on the day of Pentecost, on, in Acts chapter number 2, they got saved, right? He preached, how many people got saved? How many? 3,000 people got saved. Watch what happened. He takes them from conversion to community. Everybody say, from conversion to community. Your conversion is your personal experience. It's what God did for you, in you. It's your name being in the book. You don't get into heaven in a group. You do not stand before the judgment seat with a group. Where you're like, well, God, they did. I ain't really want to go. I was just kind of in the car. Because when you start pointing, the Lord, I would imagine he just start pulling stuff up on the screens. Because He was like, well, they weren't there then. end. That, that was you. Zoom in. Zoom in, Angel. See, give me another angle. Give me another angle of them. Ain't that you? Yeah. Your conversion is alone. But your growth has to happen in community. Did you hear what I said? Okay, so, so they get saved and the next thing they start doing is small groups. They start reading the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, prayer. They're going from house to house and the temple. Watch this. Don't let people trick you into saying, in the book of Acts, they didn't even really go to church. That's a lie. That's a lie. That's not the Bible. The Bible says they were from house to house and in the temple. Well, you know, I'm just, I just believe that the Lord just going to move in the house. Yep, he's going to move in your house and at the temple. This is the temple. Well, the Bible said the Lord don't dwell in temples made of stone. He dwells in you. And when we come together, we are his dwelling place. Let me tell you why this is important. Because none of us have all of God by ourselves. There are aspects to the fullness of God that you don't get till you get with somebody else. Glory to God. You can't even help me, Paul, Ephesians chapter number 3. You can't even comprehend the height, the depth, the breadth, the width of the love of God until you get with somebody else. See, see, watch this. Let me tell you. There are certain things about God you don't even understand till you start hanging with people. You start getting around other believers. You start realizing we have aughts and we have issues. We have differences. We have things that you like and I, and I like. Things that you don't like and I don't like. And we have all of these things, yet God loves all of us. You've got all these different stories but one Savior. And so now you start to realize I'm not the only person God loved enough to bring out of what we were in, but I am a part of a whole family of people that were brought out of deep darkness and into marvelous light. I don't, I don't even get to see how forgiving God is till I'm in the midst of community and have to forgive somebody. Okay, I got, I got a question for you. Like, I think church hurt is real. I think it's real. I don't minimize it. But here's the truth. I don't know anybody more hurt by church than Jesus. Can you imagine being crucified by your creation? And then hanging there and the only way you can die 
for their sins, the first thing you have to do is forgive them. Because if you die in unforgiveness, you can't die sinless. So in order for the crucifixion to even be effective, I have to forgive you. So I have to look at the Father and say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do, even though I know they calculated what they're doing. And so it's in the context of community when you have to be around people and you say, well, I know they intended to do this to me and they said this to me and they did this. And the Lord's like, "Uh uh-huh, but you don't even know the fullness of my love until you have to bump into each other like that and realize that I loved all of you enough to forgive you with nails in my hands. Lord, I don't know if I can forgive people. They stab me in the back. He says, well, try your feet. In your hands, try a cat of nine tails, that, that, leather de- uh, that device of leather straps with chains and bones and nails on it that they ripped into your flesh. And when they pulled it out, it caused your, your flesh to rip up from your body and hang down like ribbons. He said, try that. I don't know the fullness of God until I come into the context of community. So the wrestling match I have is, you know, I grew up in church. I'm grateful for that. I really am. I'm grateful. I grew up in church. <clears throat> I grew up in church. Contrary to popular belief, I ain't been saved all my life. I've been saved majority of my life, which means the worst mistakes I made in my life, I made saved. The dumbest stuff I did, I did save. Everybody understand that? So, 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 um, I though, I want my faith to be real. Like, I don't like fake stuff. I didn't run from God. Like some people say they, got, they were called to preach. I ran from the Lord. You know, when I started, I accepted my call to preach. The t- whole testimony you had to give before you said yes was you had to tell everybody you ran first. Because <laughs> if you ain't run, then you must not have really been called. I didn't really run. I kind of wrestled. And I, and I wasn't wrestling because I didn't want to be used. I was wrestling because I didn't want to be fake. I was just like, God, if I'm going to do this, I want to do it right. So if I'm going to embarrass you, just let me be. And the next thing that began to happen was, watch this. I, I care that this translates to life. I don't want to shout about something in a sanctuary I don't see in my living room. And, and I uh, find myself irritated by church antics sometimes. Like I get, it makes me itch. Because you know, we have church personalities. And it's sad, I could be in the airport and I see so and so like, oh God, that's a preacher right there. I can tell that's a pastor right there because he got to talk loud on his phone to make sure everybody around hears that he's talking about something important. <laughs> He's talking on the phone and looking out the corner of his eyes to see if we watch it. I'm like, bro, if you don't want us to hear, it's like, calm down. <laughs> and I watched just the little stuff we do, and I was like, I, I, I want to be a Christian. I don't want to be a professional church person. So I love the book of Acts because it just got real. It was, it was, they were trying to live it every day. They were bumping into each other. They were having issues, but God was still moving. And I don't want you to sanitize the scripture so much that you don't see the humanity in the midst of God's divinity. God was using broken, ordinary people and doing amazing things through them because they made a decision to live it. Let's look at the text real quick. Ah. Amen. So I want to give you a couple of characteristics of of breakthrough partnerships. I believe relationships are critical. Everybody say relationships are critical. Relationships are critical. Look at, look at verse number one. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple, the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. 
One of the first characteristics of breakthrough partnerships in your life in this year, I need you to grasp this first. I don't care how long you've been saved. The day you got saved, you got a purpose. Right? And if you don't know nothing about it, start with the Great Commission. Right? So whether that means I'm going to work in the, ins in the insurance field, right? God's going to use me there to reflect his glory and advance his kingdom to see people saved and or discipled by the way I live my life in that context. I don't want you to wait till you get to church to turn your light on. See, they don't believe it if you only shine in here. Because, y'all, we can shine in church, boy. We know what to say. We're up. We, listen, we know how to feel it. But can you represent him in an environment that up is not acceptable? Because one of the things I think revival is going to bring to us is a radical return to simplicity, to authenticity, and living out this gospel in a powerful way because we really believe it and what you believe will be lived. So, 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 peep this, peep this. So they, one of the first signs of breakthrough partnerships is the commitment to both Christ and community. You're going to know you got the right prayer partner because of their level of commitment to Jesus. Second, second characteristic is going to be the connection. Everybody say the connection. Now, Peter and John. How many of y'all have heard this passage preached before? Acts chapter 3. Y'all think I'm just going to talk about the lame man, get healed, all this, that, and the other. Let's look at it from a different angle. Same text, different angle. I want to look at the relational dynamics that surrounded this man's miracle. Because when you look at Peter and John, they are apostles. Right? They're apostles, right? They were also disciples, right? If you know your Bible a little bit, you know that they both came from fishing backgrounds. Okay? They used to work as partners in that environment. And so they are connected based upon their past. They are connected based upon their profession. They are connect, connected based upon their pursuit of Jesus. But just because they have these points of connection doesn't mean they, have, they don't have differences of opinions and perspectives. Can I take it a step further? One of the things you'll find is that Peter is a loud mouth. Now, John's got a temper, but he don't go there that quick. Peter's like, he'll cut you and ask questions later. John has the same kind of anger issues. John was like, they went to a city and the people weren't serving God. They were, they were, he says, Lord, can we call fire down on them jokers? John said, hey, y'all know we try to paint John like he's just real laid back and calm. Now, John's mad too. Peter just swings the sword faster. John's like, I'm going to pray about God sending fire. Peter's like, no, I'm about to fire him up myself. God can fix it later. He can put his ear back on. I can imagine y'all when Jesus picked the man's ear and put it back. Peter was still over there like this. Hit you again. So they're flowing together, but they have different personalities. But God gave them the personalities they need for the purpose they have. Are you in the room? Can I take this step further? Watch this. When Jesus was resurrected, John heard the word. And him and Peter took off. Here's what's crazy about their relationship. We see them walking together in the book of Acts. What some of us don't know is Peter was believed to be one of the oldest disciples and John was believed to be the youngest. So here you have two different generations running together. I wish I had some help in here. No, no. So when they hear the word that Jesus got up, they take off to the tomb. Because John is younger, he gets there first. When John gets there first, he looks in. Peter gets there last and goes in. Two different personalities. Because, can I take it, can I take it a step further? John, though he is an apostle, is primarily prophetic. His job is to see it. 
Peter's anointing is apostolic. He don't just want to see it. He want to get into it. And for where God is getting ready to take the church, you need the seers and the goers to get there together. And I don't care whether you see or step. Let's just see that he got up. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, God is bringing you into the right partnerships. I gotta hurry, gotta hurry, gotta hurry. Can you, can you have people who love God in your presence and you not be irritated by their differences? Peter doesn't have time to pause and fuss at John for not walking in. And ain't no need in John being aggravated. Talking about, talking about, Peter always got show out. <laughs> he don't even know if he's safe. He's walking all up in there. <laughs> Except the fact that God puts in his body what he needs in his body. And you got to be mature enough to deal with the personality differences that come. Some of the stuff that you call right or wrong is really preference. Let me ask you a question. Does John standing there looking change whether or not Jesus got up? Does Peter stepping in the tomb change whether or not Jesus got up? So why are we arguing at the tomb? When he's waiting on us in Galilee, where is God waiting on you to get to when you get over your relational differences? Let me tell you, so, so they're, 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 they're committed to the place of prayer is become a way of life for them. But it's important that this commitment to prayer and this culture of prayer does it make them indifferent to the condition of their community? Because it's really good that they're praying, right? But I don't want my commitment to prayer to be an excuse for my lack of compassion. I got to I got to I got to get in the presence of the Lord. And I just thought, oh, I got to protect my anointing from people who don't understand what I'm, what I want. I just, I just, I just. <laughs> And what happens is people are trying to realize if y'all say more prayer, more power, then all that praying you're doing, you must have some power. What is the power for? Louder shouting? Or did the power come so you could be a witness? Because under the shadow of our steeple is a community who needs us. It was said, uh-oh, is that some of us, oh God, would rather, and we should pray. But, but, but we won't even pause to feel where people are. I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. So, so, certain man, lame from his mother's womb, is carried and laid at the gate. They put him here every day. Now, we know what happened, so I got to fast forward through the text, due to time. But we know that he sits here to ask for, for coins. He sees Peter and John coming to pray. Because they're coming to pray, he sees them, and what he's accustomed to is, I ask, they give me more coins. These men watch their compassion. They say, look at us. Now, I need you to see their collaboration, too. Watch this. Peep this. Peter, fastening his eyes on him with John. Okay? Come on, Tyler. You got to help me real quick. Help me real quick. So, so Peter, 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 lame man sitting there. Peter says, 
He's standing there looking at him with John. Here's, here's what he said. Look at us. The text doesn't say John said anything. It doesn't say John said, silver and gold have I none, such as I have, give unto thee. He said, look at us, because here's what he understood. We're a team. And he needs to know that the volume of his voice doesn't determine his value in my life. John has to be able to stand here and recognize when this ministry moment is not his to lead. Here's the question. Can you be present and committed without being the center of attention? Because I love the way Luke intentionally adds in the text. He fastened his eyes on him with John. Because what he wants you to not miss is that though Peter led the way, they were in agreement. And, and here's the deal. I don't have to be the first, the only, or the loudest. Just let me be in agreement. Because if God does it, does it God is going to get the glory. And I won't let you leading the way make me disconnect from what God is doing. Let me tell you what's crazy, because do you, like John, have the capacity to recognize when it's just somebody else's time? Because what J Peter is in the early church, John is to the end time church. Peter did all the preaching when it started. But when John got banished to the Isle of Patmos, he left us with the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Tell somebody, if you wait your turn, God will get all the glory he intends out of your life. But sometimes the experience of being able to walk with somebody and they take the blows before you have to experience them will prepare you for the battles that will come when your time comes. They're not arguing to see who's going to say it or do it first. Their hearts are pure. Let's just get the man up. Let's just get the man up. So then they say, here's the truth, buddy. Silver and gold have I none. I know you're lame. I, I know you're lacking, I know looking, I know you're hurting, I know what you're used to, but this is not that. Last thing I need you to see about your partnerships is the contribution. No partnership is strong without mutual contribution. Watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. last thing, last thing, watch this, watch this. We talk about Peter saying, silver and gold have I none, such as I have. Give, give I thee. And if we're not careful, and we don't carefully look at the text, preachers. Harvard School of Ministry signed up today. Um, if we don't carefully look at the text, we will think the only people that made the real contribution to the lame man was Peter and John. At the expense of overlooking the fact of how this man even got in the right place at the right time anyway. I want to close by talking about the they in verse 2. Certain man lame from his mother's womb was, was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple. I want to know who they are. Because this man was lame from his mother's womb. But y'all lay him daily? It is believed if you look at chapter 4, this man was over 40 years old. So at least for 30 years, you've been carrying this man to the gate. Can I preach? 
can I preach to the people that have ever gotten tired of carrying somebody with no sign of them getting better? I came to preach to some caretakers. I came to preach to some people who said, the truth is, Bishop, I have carried them so long, I forgot what it was like to walk without them. Uh, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, the next three minutes is for the carriers. Can I preach to the people who will make sure they get to the gate? Uh-huh, every now and then, you gotta thank God for the people that got you to the gate. Now let me tell you how we are. Typically we preach and say the problem is they left him outside of the gate and they were going in worshiping and they didn't even take the man in. But I would like to look at it slightly differently. Sometimes instead of complaining for where people couldn't take you, you ought to praise God that they carried you as far as they could lean over and tell somebody fact of the matter is I used to lose sleep over what mama didn't do but now I'm getting ready to praise God that she carried me as far as she could sometimes you leave a church saying I outgrew the church and I couldn't and I got to no 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 hush your mouth and praise God that they carried you as far as they could cause the fact of the matter is can you imagine how much love it takes every day to keep picking somebody up? Wake up in the morning, wash your face, brush your teeth, clean yourself, get you dressed, get your family in order, then stop by the lame man and carry him to the temple and make sure he's there. Ah, can I preach like I need to? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. The next minute and a half is dedicated to the carriers. I need to tell you, sometimes don't stop carrying them. Stop feeling bad for what you can't do, but thank God for what you can do. And every now and then you gotta tell folk, this is as far as I can go. I can't take you all the way. The rest of the way you gonna have to get there yourself. But I ain't. Uh, can get you to the gate, but I can't take you across the threshold. Can I give you some relief for the next 60 seconds? Can I, it's okay to recognize that I can get you here, even if I can't get you healed. I know somebody who's able to heal. I know somebody who's able to deliver. And if I can get you to the gate, I know God can get the glory. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, now the next 30 seconds is for the people who didn't just carry, but for the people who dropped some coins. Can I preach like I need to? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I didn't have the strength to carry, but I gave the best I could. And I believe the lame man would look up and say, thank you for every meal that you gave out every other Tuesday. Thank you for every drop of clothing that you put on my back. It didn't get me healed, but it got me here. And I'm so glad that you left some coins in the bucket. I wish I had a quarter. I drop a coin right here at the altar. You ought to pray Praise God. Somebody say, I went to church and I didn't get everything I needed, but I'm so glad that I still came because the fact that I came got me close enough for God to touch me and give me what I need. Give me some coins right there. The coins let me know that somebody cared. The coins let me know that if I keep coming here one day, my treasure is going to turn into a touch. And when I get a touch, I'm about to get up. Yeah! 
<laughs> Lean over, tell somebody. God's getting ready to give you a touch. He's been giving you just enough blessing to keep you in the atmosphere. But at the right time, but at the right time, God's getting ready to turn that thing around. Look at your neighbor and say, turn it around. God's getting ready to turn it around in your life. God's getting ready. Release your miracle. God's getting ready to get you up again. God's getting ready to shift your trajectory. Shout yes. Yeah! 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 Why don't you just lean over and find you a neighbor and say, neighbor, before I leave, I'm looking for a prayer partner. I'm looking for somebody. I've had people that could carry me. I've had people who could give me coins. But now I'm looking, I'm looking for God who will get me up and put me back on my feet. So what Peter and John understood is that John, you might be younger and I might be older. John, you might be the prophet. I might be apostolic. But if he's going to get up, it is not dependent upon my gift or your gift. It is not dependent over who is seen first. But in the name of Jesus, Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, if you get over your name and I get over my name, if you get over yourself and I get over myself, then we can lift up Jesus. And he said, ah, he said, if I be lifted, he said, if I I'll draw, won't he draw me unto himself? I'm here, cause somebody lifted Jesus. Find three people and tell them I can't do it. But in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. I can't bring you out, but in the name of Jesus, come out of that depression. I don't know everything to solve your situation, but in the name of Jesus, get back on your feet. I, I, I don't know how to bring you out, but in the name of Jesus, get up. I said, 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 get up in that name, above every name. There's no other name under heaven whereby men can be saved. Wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every other name. Get up. I came to encourage somebody who got tired of carrying 
I want to pause and praise God that you carried it this far. But God told me to tell you he'll take it from here because God's getting ready to take them up to another level where only he can do it. Listen, I want you to hear what I believe the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit is saying. As I prayed and prepared for this message, I knew the Lord wanted to heal people in the area of relationship. Sometime as a carrier, you want to be the one that changes everything for people. Sometimes you have to embrace that wasn't your job. Watch this. Savannah, watch this. Jesus would have passed by this same temple while he was alive. Which meant that same man was there when he passed by. Why didn't Jesus get him up? He left that one for Peter. Sometimes you have to embrace, I have taken it as far as I can. But I am not sovereign. I'm going to still treat you good. Get you as far as I can. Even if I can't take you in. And for those who felt like you failed because of it. The Lord told me, keep on carrying. Keep on carrying. Keep on carrying. But also I want to deal with people who felt like people let you down because, man, it's like they left me at the gate. It's like they kept on living and they just left me out there to fend for myself. Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes you have to accept the fact they carried you as far as they could. And rather than be mad at people over where they left you, be grateful that they were willing to lift you for as long as they could. Whether that's a friendship, whether that's a family member, someone, it's only God who can change your circumstance.